go. Okay, so welcome uh, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Giulio Ragazzon and uh, I'm welcoming you to the 37th uh, episode of the Iconest, Iconex uh, Youth Talks. I'm uh, talking to you from, uh, from the University of uh, Strasbourg in France, uh, but I am not uh, alone here. Uh, with me, uh, there are uh, uh, Grace Han, Liang Zhan, and uh, Wen Liu. And actually, first of all, uh, before starting this episode, I really want to thank uh, Haixia Zhang, uh, for uh, organizing uh, this event and this series of uh, uh, youth talks. Uh, I got to know her and her enthusiasm, enthusiasm is absolutely contagious. And so immediately when she proposed that I could um, uh, talk at uh, FAYAC, to give a talk at the youth talk of ICANX, I was immediately positive. And then uh, it was uh, very smooth to uh, get in touch and uh, have the other speakers uh, uh, on board. So when I had to select the other people for um, uh, the three talks that we will have today and the following panel discussion, so I was asking myself what can make Iconex uh, special with respect to the traditional conference, for example. And one, one element is that uh, because it's online, we can have uh, people from all over the world. And indeed, today uh, we have uh, uh, going uh, from east to west, one speaker that is based uh, in China, um, one speaker that is based uh, in Europe, myself, and then we have a speaker and a, speaker and a panelist that are based uh, in the US. So uh, today's event is really uh, global. But then, of course, um, it's also a matter of finding uh, a theme that brings people together. And so often you might have heard some people saying that the chemistry is the central science because it connects uh, physics and biology. And so I was uh, thinking what is a theme that is central in chemistry? And of course, if you speak with different chemists, uh, they will have different answers. One possibility is that uh, because chemistry is a discipline that creates the objects that are studying, then um, a vast portion of chemists are in fact the synthetic chemists. So not only organic chemists, but also inorganic chemists, uh, material science chemists, uh, they create uh, the object that they study. And this is one thing that actually connects uh, the speakers of today. And then we also have another element. So somebody else could say that uh, every chemist in the end uh, is a physical chemist. Because uh, when we prepare the materials that we study and the molecules, then we want to understand which are the properties of these materials. And so even in the labs that are focused on different aspects, then in the end, uh, understanding the physical principle is a key, uh, is, is a core aspect of this. So from this, you might uh, guess that the, the connecting theme that brings together all of us in the end is uh, a physical organic chemistry. And uh, this is bound to um, the developments of molecular switches and molecular machines. We will see that all the speakers of today, they have a connection with this area coming from uh, different experiences. So before starting um, my talk, I want to give a little bit of introduction and I will do this actually connecting how the, uh, the science of the other speakers relates to, uh, to my background. So. Um, we have as a speaker, uh, Grace Han, that studies uh, different photochromes. And in the end, during my PhD, I studied a little bit of uh, photochromes. And that's one theme that connects uh, the two of us. Another uh, theme that connects me uh, with Liang Zhang and Wen Liu uh, is the study of interlocked uh, molecules. And this is also something that I explored during the PhD. Then, as a postdoc, I moved a little bit from the University of Bologna to the University of Padova uh, to study supramolecular assemblies uh, that operate uh, in water. And this is something uh, close to, to Wendy. And then uh, actually as uh, an assistant professor, so I got in touch with a little bit more applied research. And this is an occasion to mention already uh, that um, 
the research of uh, Grace Han uh, stems for a more applied field, and we will see in her talk how's the connection. Uh, but also, Wen Ji Liu uh, has already four patents, so that's another case where applications are connected with the with physical principles. And now, as an independent PI, one of the research lines that we have in the group uh, is connected with uh, topological material. That's a direction that uh, we want to have. And this is something that uh, is very close to the research of uh, Liang Zhang. So in these few minutes, so I told something about myself, but actually I think now you can really understand why today we have this particular uh, pool of, um, of, of speakers. And so with this, I, I will share uh, my presentation and I will tell you something about using uh, molecular machines for purposes uh, different from motion. Actually, molecular machines, uh, uh, when they proceed directionally, they implement mechanisms that are known as uh, ratchet mechanisms. So what is a macroscopic ratchet? Well, it's a mechanism that rectifies macroscopic motion. You, you can imagine to have uh, this uh, mechanism with a ratchet and a pole, and when something bounces on the pole, we can have a rotation in one direction, but not in the opposite one. In relation to nanoscience, uh, this was popularized by Feynman because uh, he has discussed the fact that uh, actually having something like this just shrunk down at the, at the molecular level uh, would not work because what matters is the shape of the barrier, uh, well, sorry, is the height of the barrier and not the shape. So we need to find uh, different mechanisms that operate at the molecular level. So what is then a molecular ratchet? A molecular ratchet is uh, a mechanism that couples an energy source to an unfavorable process. And if you want to make the connection with uh, the, the previous example, again, we, have, um, we can have an energy source, for example, a difference in temperature, that makes something that would not otherwise uh, occur, which is the unidirectional uh, rotation. So these principles, uh, historically, they have been developed uh, in the context of uh, uh, molecular motion. Moving in one direction is something uh, that requires, uh, uh, let's say, winning against microscopic reversibility, uh, overcoming it. And the theory of uh, molecular ratchets in relation to uh, motion uh, has been developed mainly by uh, Professor Astumian. And uh, the experimental realization uh, has a number of players. Absolutely, we need to mention Professor Lee, Professor Feringa, Professor Fraser Stoddart, and uh, many others that have developed uh, uh, this area. So actually, uh, what we are now trying to do as a research group is that we are trying to use the very same mechanisms, but for purposes that are different from motion. And if there is one uh, work that you might want to have a look at, I would suggest to look at this uh, review that was recently uh, published, where we uh, present uh, molecular ratchets in a very in a tutorial way and trying to highlight aspects that go uh, that that are useful besides motion so to extend a little bit the uh, area of application. So I want to uh, try to make this concept a little bit more concrete uh, by discussing the driven self-assembly of microtubules. And actually, in fact, I use the example of microtubules to connect with something that maybe is known to a broader audience. But I should say that I'm well aware that the, co that the complexity of microtubules are, is incredibly higher. So I will just highlight some uh, details of that. And also, uh, what I learned from biologists is that maybe actin is an example that is even closer to uh, what I will discuss. But anyway, the, the elements that I will highlight, uh, they are present also in the self-assembly of uh, uh, microtubules. So microtubules are formed by a GDP-rich uh, tubulin dimers, but the thermodynamic equilibrium is not shifted towards the assembled state. 
what happens is that GTP replaces uh, GDP and forms a GTP tubulin dimer. In this case, this dimer is prone to self-assembly and forms a microtubule that is thermodynamically stable. In the assembled state, um, what happens is uh, um, GTP hydrolysis releases inorganic phosphate and forming the high energy GDP rich microtubule. We have a chemical reaction cycle and the system accumulates before the slowest step. So because the slowest step is the disassembly in microtubules with a very elaborated mechanism, then we have uh, accumulation of GDP rich microtubules. If we consider the sequence of the three green reactions, what we have in that reaction is the hydrolysis of uh, uh, GTP, which is a substrate that acts as a fuel as it provides energy, that is coupled with an assembly process. So these two processes occur together along the green path. That's to say that tubulin dimers, they catalyze GTP hydrolysis, but they need to assemble to do so. So the reason why it's difficult to realize something like this in artificial systems is that in the very same chemical reaction network, we can also have a binding of GTP to the assembled microtubule, then disassembly, and then release of inorganic phosphate in the monomeric state. So if we now we do the same operation that we have done before, and we consider the sequence of the three gray reactions, what we have is that now the hydrolysis of GTP is coupled with a disassembly process. Both processes are thermodynamically allowed because the hydrolysis reaction provides uh, sufficient energy to control thermodynamics, but, and therefore, kinetic uh, rules. So it is kinetics which dictate whether uh, one reaction or the other, and thus whether assembly or disassembly, will prevail. I want to reinforce this idea that kinetics is, uh, is key by showing an example of a simulation of exactly the same system that I've shown you before. First, uh, in the case of a kinetically symmetric system. So this is a system in which the green and the gray path are equally likely. In this case, uh, we can imagine of enclosing everything in a box, supplying uh, GTP, removing GTP, and uh, letting the system reach a stationary state. The circles that I'm showing here um, represent the concentration of the different species at the stationary state. So the larger the circle, the more a certain state is populated. In this case, the thermodynamically stable GTP-rich microtubules are more populated. So now we ask ourselves a quick key question, which is whether these self-assembly steps, or the, the pure self-assembly of uh, microtubules, GDP and GTP-rich, they are at equilibrium or not. This is a kinetic simulation, so we can remove all the interaction with uh, the substrate and the product and let these uh, concentrations relax. What we find is that the concentrations are identical. They do not change. This means that these self-assembly reactions remain at equilibrium even under continuous uh, consumption of substrate or fuel. In this context, I will use uh, as synonyms uh, these words. If, however, if we repeat the same uh, sequence of experiments um, with the system that is kinetically asymmetric, which means that uh, the thermodynamic properties are exactly the same, uh, but the, now the green path is faster kinetically, which just means that the transition states are lower in energy. In this case, again, we can provide the substrate, you can remove the product, and we can observe the steady state concentrations. Already, you can see that uh, the high energy microtubules now are more populated. And we can confirm that a kinetically asymmetric system can populate high energy states by relaxing uh, the system after having removed all the interaction with fuel and waste and showing that we have a complete shift in populations. So this brings us to the first uh, important message of, um, of this uh, talk which is that kinetic asymmetry allows driven self-assembly. To fix these ideas, you can have a look at this uh, animation where we see that um, a substrate preferentially binds a catalyst in the monomeric state, but then is released in the assembled state. And this is how it can transfer part of its energy um, to 
drive the formation of a self-assembly. In nature, embryonic processes are, um, are extremely common and very important. They are at the basis of conformation changes. This is what has inspired the field of molecular machines, artificial molecular machines. They are at the basis of uh, adaptation. For example, cytoskeleton uses these uh, principles and also of uh, energy transduction. For example, the synthesis of uh, ATP uh, that exploits the uh, energy of a proton gradient. In fact, in all these cases, they are enabled by a coupled, uh, uh, by coupled capitalistic processes. But actually, of course, living systems are great, but uh, there are a number of um, situations where we can also find energonic reactions in systems that are not alive. And um, to have some suggestions, uh, I found inspiration in this uh, very, very famous paper by uh, George Whitesides, Reinventing Chemistry. And here are, are a list of uh, topics that actually involve endergonic reactions. In many cases, they are also present in uh, um, living systems, but they're also present in, in non-living systems. Memory that we have, uh, for example, in our, in our phones, information processes, similarly, Catalysis uh, can be exploited in uh, endergonic processes. Dissipative systems, uh, such as uh, Belzhov-Zabotinsky reaction, for example. Uh, impossible material, and this terminology actually really comes from uh, the, the paper of um, Whitesides. This is something that includes high energy uh, materials and energy storage, because there is a, um, a transduction of energy in these processes. So. I will connect with another uh, area that is not uh, bound to, not strictly bound to living system, which is actually instant cooling technology, which is an area of technology that has uh, an overall market of about uh, $1 billion in, in, in these years. So I'm not making this connection to say that this is uh, what we should all do or that is uh, more important in, uh, than other topics I mentioned, so not, not at all. Uh, the reason why I mentioned this topic is to illustrate how ratchet mechanisms can contribute to other areas, even when maybe we, we don't immediately see the, the connection. And actually, in this case, uh, the connection of ratchets with uh, cooling technology is not something that I had, am making. It's something that was done actually before. And I should say I have to thank you, Dave Lee, for pointing me at uh, this particular paper of uh, Van der Broek, who discussed uh, uh, the possibility of a Brownian refrigerator using precisely an example of a ratchet and pole uh, introduced by Feynman. So this system uh, can operate at two different temperatures. So if uh, there are two different temperatures for the ratchet and the pole, then we can have unidirectional rotation. But this is also this also means that the opposite can also be true. So if we have uh, we force rotation, then we can cause a, a, a um, at different in temperatures. So that's one possible approach that was already uh, envisioned uh, about more than 15 years ago. And then there is another possibility. So if we look at the, um, the Nobel lecture of Ilya Prigozhin, who got the Nobel Prize for an equilibrium system, Nobel Prize in chemistry, uh, he's discussing the new supramolecular order. So by going away from equilibrium, we can form order structure. And therefore, we can imagine that if we form something that is highly ordered, then when we have relaxation uh, to equilibrium, the relaxation can be uh, entropically driven, and we can have a positive delta H, and we can, we can have something that cools uh, down the solution. So this is something that is a little bit uh, simpler to imagine with, uh, with molecules, and actually, we bumped uh, into, this, uh, into this effect uh, quite soon, uh, actually one of the first papers of, uh, of the lab. So this work has been inspired clearly by a beautiful design uh, by the Lee group of um, a, a rotaxan that can assemble as a consequence of a sequence of uh, acid-base reactions. So in the components that you see now on, uh, on the screen, what happens is that um, we have a macrocycle, but there is only a very weak recognition side uh, along the axle. And therefore, uh, for this reason, the equilibrium is completely shifted towards the separated components. We have an amino group, but it's deprotonated, so it's not a good station. 
Another reason why this equilibrium is shifted towards the, actually this reaction uh, is shifted towards the reactant is that actually threading is also very slow. But the possibility to make this reaction happen and have the ring that threads onto uh, the axle, even in a situation that is not favored, is to alternate acid and base. So if we add an acid in solution, what happens is that the hydrazone bond that controls uh, the stopper becomes dynamic and the amino group uh, becomes an ammonium ion, which is uh, a very good binding site for the macrocycle. Therefore, the bottom equilibrium is shifted towards the product. We can have threading of the macrocycle um, to form a, essentially a pseudorotaxan. But then when we add a base, we have uh, deprotonation, the ring shatters on, onto the triazolium, and we form the target high energy state. A very general property is that in this case, both thermodynamic and kinetic features uh, are switched during this addition of base and then um, of acid and base. The question that we wanted to address is how much energy does remain stored in such a target high energy state? So we reason that if we could uh, modulate the size of the pseudo stopper that is controlled by this um, uh, hydrazone that is highlighted in yellow, then we could modulate the uh, de-threading speed and monitor the de-threading in a calorimeter. So we tried a number of different uh, hydrazides and then were used to form the hydrazone. But immediately we bumped into the what is called the or or nothing substituent effect, which was observed uh, more than 20, about 25 years ago by the Stoddard group, uh, which is that either the ring was remaining trapped for a very long time, several days, or it was de-threading uh, very fast before the time required to measure the first uh, NMR spectrum, essentially. So we tried to rationalize our observation and to do this, uh, we use the sterimol uh, parameters. These are uh, steric parameters that consider for a given substituent uh, the length and the uh, longest distance that is perpendicular to the maximum length. So then there are other parameters, uh, um, for example, the shortest uh, distance that is perpendicular to the longest distance. Uh, but we found that these two were quite informative because um, for every hydrazide that we tested, we plotted its position as a function of uh, the parameters L and B5, so the longest uh, um, direction and the shortest, the, the longest direction perpendicular to the uh, longest uh, axis. Now, for example, in this case, for this hydrazide, we have uh, a parameter. Uh, WL, so it's the Boltzmann weighted parameter for different conformation of this hydrazide that is about um, a little bit larger than 7.5 uh, uh, Ohmstrom and a WB5 parameter that is a little bit lower than 6 Ohmstrom. In this case, with the triangle, we uh, identify uh, stoppers that afford a very slow de-threading. We repeated this for all uh, the other hydrazide that we tested, and we observed that uh, the substituents that are blocked are in the periphery of this graph. But one family in particular caught our attention. So when we consider the isopropyl substituted hydrazides, uh, one of them is blocked. Uh, two of them, they, they induce very fast de-threading, but one of them is even very, very close uh, to, um, to another substituent that actually uh, induces uh, um, a very long uh, uh, kinetic stability. So we imagine that uh, we were uh, kind of close uh, to, the, um, to the correct regime. And uh, the interactions that uh, are at play in this case, uh, so for the de-threading, we have... Uh, the, the height of the barrier, the position of the transition state, which depends on the steric, steric parameters, essentially, most likely, whereas the stability of the high energy states depends from hydrogen bonding interaction. So we reason that if uh, we could use a less competitive solvent for a hydrogen bond, 
then we would stabilize a little bit the high energy state and uh, retrieve a slower defreading kinetic, uh, which we could allow to observe uh, the threading kinetic on the NMR time scale, which in turn enables calorimetry experiments. And indeed, by working in a mixed solvent with uh, chloroform and acetonitrile, then we could observe a defreading kinetic that was nicely matching uh, a first order uh, defreading. With this um, para isopropyl uh, derivative in hand, we went to perform calorimetry experiment. The one we what we recorded was the following. So we we prepare the system under a CD condition, and then we add a base which forms uh, the high energy uh, deprotonated state. And then here in the calorimeter, we observe first uh, uh, a heat uh, that is released. And then uh, an effect of uh, absorption of heat that is uh, much um, smaller in comparison. But then thanks to, to, to control experiments, we could confirm that the first effect uh, is dictated by the acid-base reaction, essentially. Whereas uh, the second uh, um, component of heat absorption is only due to uh, a recognition process because the white point that you're seeing on screen they are an identical experiment performed with the separated components. So we still have the acid-base reaction, but we do not have uh, the self-assembly. And we observe the, uh, he, 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 the released heat, uh, even when we have just an acid-base reaction. So here the effect might seem uh, small, uh, but if we simply zoom in into this region, the data looks much nicer. and. Um, um, the moment where I was convinced and uh, all our collaborators then were convinced that uh, this was really a dethreading process is when we could fit this uh, dethreading kinetic with the data observed and determined in the NMR experiments. And I can reassure you that if we use a constant that is 10% larger or 10% smaller, uh, the fit is not good anymore, which supports that there is a very tight uh, connection of these two processes. The value of the enthalpy that we found for this, find the, for this process is 20 kJ per mole. What does this mean? Actually, this uh, stored uh, this enthalpy that is stored in the system is comparable to instantaneous ice uh, packs, those that we use when, for example, uh, we hurt ourselves and we want to cool it down instantaneously. So I think here uh, a key message is that um, as soon as we looked into energetic properties, we found that even a simple uh, um, rotaxon, uh, the first um, example that we looked uh, into in a little bit more detail, uh, then had properties that are comparable essentially with what we use uh, every day. I would not be surprised if uh, additional developments over time could show that maybe um, creating uh, highly organized uh, states uh, could uh, be a strategy to, to cool uh, the surrounding solution, for example. And actually, this is something that uh, we want to explore um, with um, redox active systems. And recently, we have explored um, uh, how to drive autonomously the self assembly of uh, a redox active uh, system. So, in this case, the molecules that we that we used are a calixarin, a calix sixarin, and uh, a virogen unit. So this is a well-known uh, recognition motif in supramolecular chemistry, which in organic solvents has a, a binding um, binding constant of about 10 to the 6. I will show here a simplified um, cyclic voltammetry. Actually, this is just a cartoon uh, representation. And the reason why it's a cartoon representation is to because I want to illustrate two key uh, elements that will uh, serve to understand um, data that will come later on. So in this case, if we mix a solution of uh, a calixarin and a virogen, and then we perform a cyclic voltammetry, the first process that is observed is a reduction process, which corresponds to the reduction of the assembled species. There is a stabilization of the assembled species, and therefore we need to go to relatively negative potentials to uh, reduce the system. This process is not reversible because it, uh, soon after that, we have a dethreading process. And therefore, in the reoxidation scan, what we find is the reoxidation of the free species. So by reducing and oxidizing, we can control um, threading and dethreading. 
You, uh, you might uh, recall that in previous example, we had uh, in both cases uh, a chemical reaction cycle, and also here we can construct a chemical reaction cycle. We have the assembly process, the reduction, and then the disassembly and uh, a subsequent oxy oxidation. How can we create a symmetry in such cycle? The possibility that we explored was to use a scanning electrochemical microscope setup. This is an electrochemical setup that allows controlling two different uh, potentials simultaneously. This is something that with, uh, with the basic electrochemical setup is not possible, but uh, um, kind of electrochemical microscope and biopotentiostats in general are allowed to do this. We wanted to place our system uh, under the microscope and induce uh, the directional cycling of this uh, chemical reaction network. But what is the challenge? The challenge here is to avoid unproductive cycles. So we wanted the self-assembly to be part of the cycle. Uh, but if, for example, the reduced species diff diffuses directly to the opposite electrode, then the self-assembly steps are become off pathway and they simply adjust to the concentration of uh, reduced and oxidized species, but they are not driven away from equilibrium. The same is true for the opposite uh, path. So we have indeed experimentally demonstrated that this is the, the case, and I will show you just one, uh, one example of how uh, we did that. So for example, in this case, uh, we wanted to, to demonstrate that uh, de-threading occurs before diffusion to the opposite electrode. So in this case, uh, we performed the following experiment. We kept the substrate at minus 0 0.8 uh, volt, which is a potential that is suitable to reduce uh, the complex. And then we scanned uh, the tip electrode. By scanning the tip, what we have uh, observed is a current that appears, is an oxidation current that appears uh, at about minus uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 volts. And this is a potential that is compatible with uh, the oxidation of the three species. And uh, if the, co the complex species would uh, arrive to the opposite electrode, we would observe the oxidation at much uh, more negative potential. So overall, we can confirm with this data that the threading occurs uh, faster uh, than diffusion. We did the same also for the other processes. Because we knew all the rate constants that were involved in the systems, in the system, then we could uh, simulate what was uh, occurring and we could reproduce all the experimental observation. And we monitored uh, where the dissipation of energy was taking place. So where the chemical reaction, the reactions are away from equilibrium, essentially. Because we are monitoring steady state properties, um, the overall amount of energy that is in the system does not change. So it means that if we dissipate a certain amount of energy, then we also absorb a given amount of energy. And this can be used to calculate the efficiency of energy uh, absorption. And what we found is that this system has 9% efficiency of energy absorption, which is essentially the highest efficiency reported to date for an autonomous system. So here, the important message is that we are essentially completely detaching from motion to fully focus on the energetic properties. And this allows to get uh, much better energetic properties. So uh, it's not that the, the energy involved is the only interesting parameter, so I, um, I don't, I'm not claiming this. But if we focus on this particular parameter, which is, I think, a significant one, then uh, detaching from motion and directionality in space uh, enables having uh, much higher efficiencies. How does this connect to uh, broader challenges such as heating and cooling? Well, actually, uh, in a different work a few years ago, and uh, not connected with this uh, area, uh, but uh, Yamada and colleagues uh, reported the fact that uh, by applying a difference uh, in temperature to a self-assembling system composed by um, an iodine-iodide uh, pair, triodide-iodine pair, iodide-triodine pair, and alpha-cyclodextrin, they could apply a temperature difference and uh, record a potential difference. So they connected uh, temperature and um, potential. And actually what they found is that they obtained the highest Zeebeck coefficient uh, measured at room temperature, which is two millivolts uh, per Kelvin. 
So again, this is a case in which um, uh, by driving systems away from equilibrium, we can connect with different areas of, of science related with the uh, conversion of, between different forms uh, of energy. In the last uh, 30 minutes or so, I discussed the uh, molecular ratchets, which are the uh, mechanisms at the base of molecular machines, but for different purposes, for driving self-assembly, for storing energy and possibly uh, cooling, and for um, realizing efficient energy conversion. So overall, uh, these are what brings these teams together are endergonic processes uh, going beyond uh, molecular machines. And this is a topic that uh, is, uh, has been introduced uh, in a, I mean, that is covered in a tutorial in, in a tutorial way introduced. I mean, in, I, I intend the meaning of uh, uh, introduced in a tutorial way. Of course, this was there before uh, our contributes. There were already some examples. Um, in this article that um, I encourage you to have a look if you're interested in these uh, themes. And with this, I really want to thank uh, the members of uh, my lab, Simone, Shaima, Fabiana, Ahmad, Titipon, Kaiwan, Katerina, Haidang, and um, uh, Suleiman. All the collaborators, so the work that I've shown uh, here was done in, collaborator, in collaboration with Serena Silvia, Alberto Cray, Stefano Rapino, Emanuele Penocchio, and some recent work with uh, uh, Christian Pensato, Jean Prosoni, Irene Garten, and then also uh, Leonel Prince at the University of Padova and Maurizio Prato at the University of Trieste, as well as all uh, their uh, group members and the staff of, uh, of ISIS. So I thank you very much. And um, with this, uh, I pass it on um, to the next talk. I will stop sharing my slides and I share again the uh, general introduction of the different uh, speakers. And here I introduce. Uh, uh, Grace Hunt. So Grace is uh, now uh, based at Brandeis uh, University. Uh, she received her PhD in chemistry at uh, MIT, uh, studying under the guidance of uh, Professor Timothy Swagger. And during her doctoral uh, studies, um, uh, she developed uh, organic uh, uh, semiconductors for application in photovoltaics. Uh, then uh, she moved to the MIT Department of Material Science and Engineering uh, to work with uh, Professor Jeffrey Grossman. And uh, she explored different areas of uh, science, uh, which include solar thermal fuels, which is something that uh, you will uh, probably see also today, bidimensional materials, and atomic resolution, resolution imaging of uh, uh, nanostructures. Uh, she is an independent researcher from since 2018, when she started her independent career as a Landsman assistant professor at uh, Brandeis University. So her uh, the research of her uh, group uh, focuses on the interaction of, of light with different uh, photo switching compounds, and uh, I want to mention uh, two awards that uh, she has uh, received the NSF uh, Career Award, and um, another one that is the Sloan Research Fellowship, which maybe is an award that there is uh, uh, new uh, to many people in the audience. But uh, uh, I should say that uh, one of the past recipients of this award is uh, Monji Bowendi, which uh, is the recipient of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry uh, 2023. And so um, I hope this does not put too much pressure on Grace Han, but instead highlights uh, how promising her research is. So with this, I invite her to share uh, her uh, uh, slides and guide us through uh, her research. Uh, All right. Um, I'm hoping that you guys are seeing the slides. Okay. Yes, perfect. All right. Thank you for the uh, you know, wonderful introduction and for invitation to be presenting our work uh, in this wonderful 
platform. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm Grace Han uh, in Brandeis University. For those of you who are less familiar with where we are, so I have this map here. Uh, so we are basically in greater Boston area, about 15 kilometers west of Boston, so pretty close. Um, so, so my lab is working on the light res development of light responsive, um, you know, molecular switches for uh, various applications, including energy storage. Um, and so I started my career uh, at Brandeis in 2018, so about five years ago. And uh, we were uh, trying to address the question uh, of like, how are we going to apply this very sophisticated uh, and well-designed molecular machines for uh, emerging applications uh, such as energy uh, storage and conversion. Um, right, so let's move on to, yeah. The intro. So I'd like to give uh, this audience a little bit of background of what light responsive molecules or photo switches are. So these are found in nature, uh, in particular at the photoreceptors in retina. Um, so you'll find this uh, molecule called retinol. So basically it switches um, between the Z conformation and E conformation about the double bond. So in response to the light absorption and by doing this shape transition, it can reversibly bind to the um, rhodopsin and it can uh, convert to light energy like photon signal to chemical signals. And this is a mechanism of enabling vision uh, in our eyes. And some of you may be familiar with photochromic lenses where you can find uh, this uh, particular photochrome of cold naphthoparin. So this now undergoes ring opening, on, um, ring opening process uh, when it absorbs UV photons. So when you walk outdoor, um, this will you know, ring open and become darker. So, and then when you're walking indoor again, the primarily um, you know, visible light light is being absorbed by this dye. So this becomes closed again, restoring the clearness. So this is how you change the shade. Uh, so many of these photo switches have been applied to, um, you know, for photopharmacology for controlling the biological targets and systems. Uh, for example, uh, in this example, you're looking at this biologically active molecule called sulfonylurea and it's functionalized with azobenzene, which is one of the common photo switching molecule. So it changes shape in response to uh, light absorption and it reversibly binds to this uh, intermembrane, uh, transmembrane proteins. And by doing this, you can optically control the you know biological functions like um, the, you know insulin release from the human pancreatic beta cells in this particular case. And you'll have some other switches like um, diarethene that is seen in this photo um, where it undergoes the reversible ring opening closing isomerization in response to light. And in this case, it's changing the conductivity across the molecule you're breaking and making conjugation path. So now you can have this very small molecular system as, um, you know, tiny uh, molecular, uh, I guess, photodiode. So you can in incorporate it into your nano devices like graphene connected uh, nano circuits. Also, if you are incorporating uh, switches to polymers, let's say it can uh, swell or bend in response to light. So you can actually um, change, uh, I guess, convert the photon energy into mechanical work. So in this case, locomotion. So all of these examples really nicely portray how uh, this light response in molecules um, can be utilized for you know, various application, uh, primarily taking advantage of their structural change and optical property change and the conductivity change. Uh, but one of the things that the my group is the most interested in in um, photo switching field is the energetics of photoisomerization. So here I'm uh, giving you a very uh, simple molecule, which is azobenzene. So here in the center, I'm hoping that uh, my laser pointer is visible. Yeah, so we have the nitrogen-nitrogen double bond, the azo group in the center. 
and we have two phenyl groups uh, attached to that. So this simple azobenzene molecule adopts planar shape um, as a ground state or thermodynamically most, most stable state. But this E isomer absorbs mostly UV light to undergo the rotation or inversion about the nitrogen-nitrogen double bond and become um, twisted to form this Z isomeric state. So if you take a closer look at the structure, there's this intramolecular steric hindrance or a repulsion among the two CH groups. Therefore, it becomes metastable. Uh, and this Z isomer is the one that stores energy. And the amount of energy it's storing is basically the gap between the E isomer, the planar E isomer, and the twisted Z isomer. So this energy is being stored in the metastable state, but this doesn't readily go back to the ground state because of this uh, activation barrier that is present. So uh, there are mostly, uh, I mean, there are a few different ways to uh, make this reversion happen. So this is a triggering process. One common thing is uh, thermal activation. So you're going to push this metastable state over this activation barrier so it can go back to the ground state. Uh, second one uh, that's also very common is photochemical triggering. So you will excite the metastable state with visible light irradiation and it can um, go back to the ground state at the same time releasing the energy that had been stored in the Z isomeric form. So the energy is released as thermal energy in this case. So it's called a uh, molecular solar thermal energy storage process. And I'd like to highlight that uh, this is really about direct conversion and storage of solar energy as chemical energy. I like to highlight storage because, uh, you know, if you were to compare this molecular solar thermal energy storage to, you know, more established solar technologies such as, um, you know, solar cells or, um, photo-induced water splitting, um, those two technologies are really wonderful and they do produce uh, electricity or gas fuels that have to be stored in other mediums such as batteries or gas tanks for storage and you know for later use. But in our molecular system, everything is in the closed system. So energy is stored in directly in the molecular structure and uh, released later. So you don't need the separate storage unit. Uh, and heat is being released instead of electricity or a gas. Um, and this process is high, highly cyclable. And I, I like to uh, emphasize how important um, heating is actually. Um, you know, a lot of times heat is regarded as lower grade energy co in comparison to electricity. Uh, but in reality, um, if you take a look at the global energy consumption ratio, heating is the most uh, on demand. So in demand, so we have this 50% of energy being dedicated to uh, heat. Uh, and about 50% of this yellow fraction is really devoted to uh, space and water heating in buildings. So these are really not thousands of degrees of Celsius high temperature heat, but rather uh, less than 150 degrees Celsius lower temperature heating. So, and we are heavily relying on the fossil fuels to provide this heating. So we are really trying to increase this green fraction, which is renewable energy source for heating, in particular, this solar thermal energy as a renewable source for heating. So right now it's about 1%, but we are hoping to increase this. And um, we are not of course, the first group to look into the system, uh, molecular solar thermal energy storage, but there are um, these four molecules, um, uh, norbornadienes, azobenzene, dihydroazoline, and covalent diruthiniums uh, have been studied, really pioneered by Casper Mose Polson, Jeff Grossman, uh, Morgan Branson Nielsen, and uh, Peter Volhart. But um, these have been really beautifully demonstrated how they switch back and forth and how they have 
you know, potential to store energy, but most of them have been investigated primarily in solutions or, um, you know, performed by computation. So here I'd like to um, emphasize how, um, you know, these switching processes that have been studied in solution state or gas phase do not really translate to condensed phases. For example, this com um, compound azobenzene in e isomeric state, they're planar, and in the solid state, they form this crystal. And if you take a look at the packing, it's really close packed and at very high density. So the problem is, even if they're uh, exposed to UV light, they do not have the confirmation of freedom, so they cannot switch in the solid state. So what you need to do is to dissolve this azobenzene in you know, solvent and irradiate it, so make the switching happen, and evaporate the solvent to um, obtain the different type of crystal, which is C azobenzene. So the bottom line is you cannot uh, do the direct switching between these two crystalline states in condensed phase. So one of the biggest issue of having to dissolve the switches in solvent is that for energy perspective, everything, the energy that is stored in individual molecules is then um, heavily diluted to a uh, large volume of solvent. So overall energy density becomes very low. So now the question is, how are we going to achieve the direct switching in condensed phases? And how are we going to design the photo switches that enable uh, such direct switching? So we are um, uh, proposing uh, functionalization methods that will enable um, switching. Uh, in either condensed liquid or condensed uh, solid and enable large um, uh, density energy storage. So, um, so one idea is condensed liquid phase switching. So uh, by attaching some very bulky substituents uh, on the photochromic core, you can make everything intrinsically liquid and because liquid is flexible um, by nature, so you can achieve this um, you know, energy storage and energy release within the neat liquid state and store uh, and release heat. But uh, another platform is even more interesting uh, that involves uh, basically phase transition between solid and liquid. So how we enable it uh, is we start from the crystalline material that uh, that has the planar E isomeric state, and basically the R group is long molecule chain, and then because of the planarity uh, and uh, you know intermolecular pi interactions and van der Waals interactions, they can pack very nicely, forming this crystalline solid. But when it absorbs UV light, it undergoes photo melting and the isomerization simultaneously. So you'll be achieving this um, liquid state Z isomer, basically this non-planar Z photochromic head group will prevent them from stacking and forming solid and this the flexible alkyl chain will accommodate the formation of stable liquid. And in this case, upon the visible light irradiation to the liquid Z, you can release the total amount of energy that had been stored. And this is actually much greater than in the case of the li need liquid switching because now you can store and release both phase transition enthalpy that is involved between uh, for the solid liquid phase transition and the isomerization energy. That is just intrinsic energy difference between planar E and bent C isomeric state. So overall, the total energy storage value uh, is quite large. It's uh, similar to the specific energy of sodium ion battery. So it's quite significant, and it um, it uh, you know infers that the commercial vi viability of this technology is actually pretty uh, large. Um, so the now the question is. Um, this so we we can normally you know start with the crystalline state, but this process is basically converting solar energy and making storing 
uh, in the solar fuels that is in the liquid state. So in order for the fuel to work like gasoline and fossil fuels, we have to be able to store this fuel state for long period of time. And in order to transport this fuel, um, you know, to different locations, you have to have very stable fuel that would not lose energy uh, in the process. So even when the temperature change is very great, it has to always keep the liquid state in a stable fashion. So how do we achieve that? Uh, so basically, this is the calorimetric plot that you would like to see in ideal case scenario. So uh, what this shows is the crystalline nature of E isomeric form. That's the uh, the azobenzene before charging by solar energy. So you'll see very sharp uh, feature that shows melting process and crystallization process of this uh, crystalline solid. So, you know, when you see these features, it's, you know, it's crystalline. Whereas when you make the D isomer, you do not see any of those phase transition features over a wide range of temperature uh, spanning from negative 40 all the way to 80 degrees Celsius. So this means that the liquid is extremely stable, uh, even though you're changing temperature, it doesn't crash out or it doesn't solidify. It. So what's nice about this is, um, you know, within this temperature range, you can now induce photo melting of the crystalline E to liquid C, and you can also uh, achieve photo induced crystallization from C liquid to E uh, crystalline solid. So the larger the range is, the better uh, for the operation of this uh, solar fuel. So uh, one of the compounds that do exhibit uh, this sort of uh, drastic phase uh, difference between E and Z isomeric state is this. So this is uh, azo derivative. So it's not azobenzene because we substituted one of the phenyl group by this five-membered ring, which is pyrazole. Um, and then we attach the long alkyl chain there. Um, so in the crystal structure, we can see, okay, on one, um, one two-dimensional plane, you can see the little bit offset stacking between the, you know, planar photochromic cores. And if you look down the A-axis, now you, you can see that around each photochromic core, there are this uh, bunch of alkyl chains. So there aren't really strong intermolecular interactions present, except for maybe London dispersion force. So um, this uh, reduced pi interactions in the solid state uh, allows these photochromes to be able to move around and switch even in the solid state. So this uh, seems to be really a big contributor uh, to be able to see the photo-induced melting from the solid state. So next thing that's very unique about this molecular system is this very, very stable Z liquid uh, over a wide range of temperature. So this is very unusual characteristic. So in comparison to, for example, azobenzene derivatives, uh, azobenzenes typically do uh, have the crystallinity at the room temperature because even as the twisted conformation, they can stack pretty well on top of each other through the strong pi interaction. So why is, is this um, era azopyrazole Z so stable, um, unlike the azobenzene? So this really has to do with the molecular design. So we got really inspired by our collaborator, Professor Matt Fuchter's work uh, back in 2014, where they really uh, demonstrated this unique T-shaped structure of the Z isomer of the aerial azopyrazole. So when you take a look at this, um, the CH bond off of this five-membered ring, it forms this favorable intramolecular CH pi interaction with the face of the phenyl group. Therefore, now you have two, um, two uh, planes that are forming a T-shape instead of the twisted shape. So this T-shaped structure, Z isomer, is extremely difficult to stack uh, because of their geometry. Therefore, it cannot form a solid anymore. So that explains why we have particularly stable liquid phase of the Z. 
Also, uh, even this methylated version, which does not have the intramolecular CH pi interaction, still cannot stack when it's in the Z configuration because of the steric hindrance induced by this ortho methyl substitution. And additional benefit is that uh, because we have such a stable T-shaped structure of Z, this intramolecular interaction really stabilizes the energy of the metastable Z isomer, therefore increasing the energy barrier that it has to overcome to be able to go back to the ground state. Therefore, uh, this uh, specific interaction allows us to really extend the half-life of Z metastable state to all the way to 4 to 60 years compared to azobenzene, which is only a few days. And this optical spectra shows that the E and Z isomers do have quite different uh, optical spectra. So uh, we always want to achieve the well-separated spectral features between two isomers in order to uh, really enrich each isomer at high percentage by um, irradiating it with specific wavelengths. All right. Um, so uh, what does uh, what it does is that uh, now we have this crystalline E isomer that we start with. We uh, irradiate it with UV to make the liquid Z isomer. And now it's very stable. So we can cool it down to negative 30 degrees Celsius uh, without making the solid. So it's storing heat at such a low temperature until you deliberately switch it back to the E isomer. And then you can crash it out. You can solidify it and also revert to isomeric state uh, at the same time, releasing energy. So this allows us to achieve the yeah, heat storage and release at sub-zero temperature, which was the first demonstration. And it's very important for applications like de-icing and defrosting. And uh, the storage time of the liquid state extends from hours to weeks through the molecular design. All right, so we have ex uh, extended the exploration of the hetero uh, arene azo um, compound. So in this case, we have substituted both phenyl groups by five, two five-membered rings, two pyrazoles. We have tried different uh, substitution patterns. We selected this particular molecule that connects the azo group to the four position and five position of two pyrazo ring that exhibits the most separated spe optical spectra between two E and Z isomeric states to achieve uh, nearly 100% um, in the yield of the photostationary state. So you can really achieve one isomer or the other exclusively by the selective irradiation. So, and the second thing is that we got rid of the, um, the alkyl chain to really lower the molecular weight of the molecule because in the end, we really care about the gravimetric energy density of this molecular solar thermal system. Uh, so if you have really large molecules, that energy stored per mass will really decrease. So uh, we made this very small molecule, which would pack like this, had to tail fashion. And um, surprisingly, this three method group substitutions um, adjacent to the central azo group turn out to be really effective in reducing the pi interactions among the photochromes in the solid. So this enables the um, you know, switching uh, between solid and liquid upon irradiation and solid, um, you know, transition back to solid upon irradiation at 530 nanometer. Uh, we switched to uh, different derivatives with uh, different terminal groups, and they all behave identical, so meaning the terminal groups do not really uh, hinder photo switching in the crystalline state, except uh, when you, you know, make a little bit longer n purple group, then this additional disorder coming from the, the longer alkyl chain makes intrinsic liquid state for both E and Z isomers. So now you achieve something like this, a uh, neat liquid that switch back and forth in the liquid state. The implication of this is that the free compounds that do undergo solid liquid phase transition can now store over 0.3 uh, megajoule per kilogram, whereas the intrinsically neat liquid state photochromes can only store 0.2 megajoule per kilogram. 
And this 0.3 megajoule per kilogram is the benchmark that we all um, want to achieve because that's uh, similar to the specific energy of sodium ion battery. Yeah, uh, so we also expanded the scope of photo switches beyond the four categories of switches that everyone explores. So for example, hydrozones, it's very well-known switches, amazing optical property and switching properties, but um, you know the potential of hydrogens in um, storing energy, solar energy, had not been really explored, primarily because of the molecular structure. Um, basically, this metastable E isomer is also planar. It's not strained, unlike azobenzene. So both um, Z and E isomers are fairly similar structure. So the energy difference between them is supposed to be very little, also supported by the computation. So what we ended up uh, doing is to implant the intramolecular strain to this metastable E isomer by attaching the alkyl tether that connects these two parts of the hydrozone. So now you can imagine when this uh, inversion happens upon Z to E isomerization, the bottom part of the Z hydrozone will be moving to the left. So it will be switching like this. And at the same time, really stretching the alkyl tether uh, that will now induce a significant intramolecular ring strain to the cyclic E isomer. So to prove this, we have explored um, you know, a bunch of acyclic structure and cyclic structure. And first thing we did was to compare the half-life of the uh, metastable E isomer, which is, was extremely long for the acyclic structure, uh, tens of thousands of years, which got reduced to less than five years uh, when you cyclize the structure. So that implies that now your cyclic E isomer is less stable and because of this destabilization effect, you're expecting to have larger gap between the ground state Z and the metastable E, which was also experimentally measured to be true. Um, so, so this shows that yeah, molecular design can really improve energy storage density quite substantially. And we also found that the cyclic tethered uh, molecules can undergo solid liquid phase transitions as well. So that contributes to achieving the overall large energy storage density in these hydrozones. Um, so I have uh, shown you a lot of the e Z isomerization and then how it induces solid liquid phase transitions for energy storage. Uh, more recently, we have been looking into the chemical transformations that happen exclusively in the crystalline phase or the solid phase. So. Um, for the applications, if you have film that uh, stay as solid state film um, or the bulk material that stay as you know solid bulk will be very uh, important for realizing energy storage and release. So uh, I, for the interest of time, I'm going to skip a, a few slides here. But in the essence, uh, we are trying to make um, solid state energy storage material by devising the molecule that looks like this. It's donor acceptor structure of steel bean derivatives. It's diripyrillium. So because of this favorable pi interaction between electron rich airings, electron poor aromatic groups, it stack head to tail upon visible light absorption. It forms this really strained cyclobutane in the crystalline state and the, the reversion can be triggered either by UV light or heating. And so now we can achieve this uh, energy storage system that is very similar to azobenzene or hydrozone, but this is exclusively in the solid state. So uh, let me skip some of these design principles and the subtleties uh, just to show you this, um, this summary slides where uh, we our system absorbs broad range of visible light that matches pretty well with the solar spectrum. So it goes from yellow to transparent under solar simulator, you know, uh, AM 1.5, one sun uh, range. So it can be charged directly by the sunlight. And so this is a uh, little bit uh, faster video that illustrates how the yellow crystals become transparent in uh, under the light irradiation and store energy and can be released uh, in a number of cycles. 
So uh, we are exploring this uh, avenue a little further. Uh, this is one of our major uh, direction of research. And um, so we are trying to also utilize this kind of solid state energy storage system for enabling smart window technology. Basically, you start from the yellow uh, film. During the day, it, is, it absorbs sunlight, becomes transparent. And at night, it will be releasing the heat again, restoring the original state. So to summarize, uh, we are really trying to um, fine-tune chemical structures of photochromes uh, to control their intermolecular interaction in the condensed phases and also modulate the conformation or freedom of the molecules in the solid state uh, that can uh, induce light responsive phase transition and reactions uh, that are important for the sustainability application. And before I uh, stop, I'd like to just highlight that we are exploring other areas beyond energy storage uh, taking advantage of the photo switches and phase transitions, such as the recycling of catalysts and the uh, you know, photo dilation of nanopores for sensing and also you know, atomic resolution imaging of this fundamental switching process and electrochemical switching. And I'd like to thank uh, my students and collaborators and this funding agencies for supporting our work. And most importantly, thank you for your attention. And I'll be happy to answer questions at the, the Q&A discussion session. So oh, thank you. Thank you very much for guiding us um, uh, through the world of solid state uh, uh, photochemistry. As, uh, as you mentioned, uh, questions will be together at the end. If you have some, you can type them in, in the chat. And uh, with this, I introduce the next uh, the next speaker, Liang Zhang from East China Normal University. So Professor Zhang joined East China Normal University as the young outstanding young professor in 2020. And uh, his path in, uh, in science uh, begins uh, at Fudan University. Uh, but then for the PhD, he joined the group of Professor Dave Lee in uh, Manchester. Uh, where he worked on the synthesis of molecular knots and links. Uh, then he uh, became team leader of the satellite research group at East China Normal University, satellite research group of, uh, of the Lee Group. And he contributed introducing uh, biomimetic and technomimetic concepts uh, to molecular machining, machinery, and in particular established new ta tactics to provide to probe the operation mechanisms of molecular machines using single molecule techniques, and I'm sure we will some we will see some single molecules uh, techniques uh, today. Uh, this is also um, uh, was merged with pioneering uh, molecular waving. Actually, uh, for his stellar contributions, which were published in uh, uh, high impact uh, journals, he received a number of uh, of awards, and also in this case, I will highlight uh, a couple. And those that I've chosen are uh, the 2019 uh, CAS Future Leader and the Reactive PhD Prize 2019. And the reason why I choose uh, uh, these two works to, to highlight is because they go uh, beyond the national boundaries. So these are international prizes, uh, highly valuable. And if we look at the list of people who receive the Reactive PhD Prize over time, they have always grown to be uh, stellar scientists. This uh, successful career is continuing, and indeed, indeed in the end, in, for example, already also in 2023, he received the CCS, Physical Organic Chemistry uh, Newcomer Award, which is a very promising for the beginning of uh, his independent career. So with this, um, I kindly uh, ask Liang Zhang to share uh, his slides and, and, and present. Thanks, Julio. Thanks for your kind introduction. I hope uh, you can see my screen and yes, hi perfect. everyone. Yep. As uh, it's my great pleasure to join this uh, Jung's talk, and thanks uh, for I can thanks I can for offering me this great chance to share the recent research programs working in my lab. I changed my talk, uh, the title of my talk a little bit uh, 
uh, name uh, nanotopology with mechanical bond synthesis characterization and property investigation. So I located in Shanghai, this China normal inner city, and you will find uh, the detail of our lab from our group website. And moreover, we have uh, set up an uh, official WeChat account to share the recent uh, uh, results in the area of uh, nanotopology because this is a very young but attractive research area. So in my talk, uh, at the beginning, I will show you a very brief history of molecular nanotopology. In this new area, people are mainly working on the two types of the structures called knots and link. Those uh, structures are the basic element for tooth material, architecture, symbolism, and constructions. If you really pay attention to your daily life, you will say those kind of architectures are everywhere. And the different functions require actually different topologies. For example, we only use 20, around 20 different knots in our daily life. If you go sailing, you should tie the sailing knot. If you go to the hospital, you're going to need the surgery knot. They are in a totally different way to tie the knot. Knots not only exist in the microscopy world, but also exist in the molecular level. For example, in a polymer, if the polymer chain is long enough, then it will tie the knot immediately, and the knot will disappear along with the draptation of the backbone. More important thing is the knot exists in lots of biomolecules such as DNA, RNA, and a protein. You can say around 2% of the, the protein contains a noted region, around 4% protein contains a catenoid or the lasso uh, architectures. And those kind, those support you will change the physical and the chemical properties of those proteins. And for the chemistry, we actually want to construct those molecules. So uh, we have to emphasize that the northern links in the molecular level or synthetic chemists they only use for description of the special and the connectedness and the continuity of the molecules. If you can understand, you can link the knots and the links at different lengths, you're gonna able to answer three fundamental questions. That's how the different topology are formed in the different landscapes. That's the origin of the topology. Nature, not, uh, nodes and the links are abundant in nature. There must be a reason for that. The second question is, what's the topological structure and the function relationship? So why nature uses this complicated, noted, or catenized structure to perform function? And how is it? affects the fundamental physical chemical properties. It's really hard to understand those things. And the third question is what's the connection or differences between the microscopy and the uh, micro uh, molecular level? So we say they're not existing in all different length scales, but we don't know whether we can link them together. Is there anything we can learn from nature at molecular level, or we can use the molecular level things to affect the property in the microscopy world. Well, those three questions are the fundamental things we want to explore in, in, uh, with uh, chemistry. So where we get started is actually very, very early in later on 18th, because as a beginning, scientists use uh, the Lord Kevin, who is not a real chemist, but uh, he thinks that the, the world is actually uh, formed by the ether. And if you want study all the matters, you just need to understand how they were noted up by this ether. And in late, later, we realized the ether is not uh, the true because the matter was formed by the molecules. Right? However, based on these things, people realize that some, most of the scientists are saying that the understanding element by simply understanding the nodes. And the mathematician became uh, to construct the table of nodes and their pictures. For example, a lot of very famous mathematicians, such as Gaussian, they did a lot of things on that. 
then the mathematicians realize that they can only picture the law, but they don't, but they don't really, they can't really explore the uh, function and the structural property because they can only do the curves. When this area became really attractive, and the people realized that DNA can be entangled and affect the fundamental bio functions. And in the chemistry, we start from the early 1990s, Richard Wistler, who wins the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1995, proposed a ketamine in a seminar in the reach around 1902 or 1906. This is the first time that chemists say that we should use a chemical language to describe those things in chemistry, and also we want to use a chemical method to synthesize those kind of beautiful molecules. And until 1961, the Frisch and Wasserman, really, it's actually 1960, the Frisch and Wasserman reported the first synthesis of the two ketamine through a statistical approach. And in the next year, they define the whole area and call it chemical topology. And with the rapid development in the last 13 years, the first student who won the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 2016 redefined the whole area called the molecular nanotopology. And uh, it mentioned in the first paper saying that uh, joining a new era in molecular nanotechnology called the age of molecular nan uh, nanotopology. You can say this field is very young but really attractive. However, there must be a lot of reason that. Uh, we didn't do a lot of things in the early days. This is the sentence published by uh, G, uh, Jimmy Sanders in his science paper, trivial knots paper. He mentioned that the synthesis of this molecular knots also other molecular topologies is particularly difficult because it requires a precisely defined pathway and the transition state that are entropically much more demanding than topologically simply micro, microcyclization. The people know that it's really hard to make a microcycle apart from five or six membrane. When you get the number of the atoms in a ring increase, you got a uh, less possibility. However, for a knot, it's also a microcycle, but you need to change it in a, in a three dimension and generate the necessary entanglement. That's what he mentioned in the paper. Sorry. And when it really became uh, realistic for synthetic chemists, is the John Pierce Lodge who developed the metal template approach. Things are really hard to control the arrangement of strand in a, in a space. So John Pierre used a metal which chelating with all different ligands that have formed a pre entangled architecture. Then the only thing you need is just to connect the strands together as you wish that will generate the desired topologies. And later on, my supervisor, they believe develops a lot of different uh, strategies based on the metal template approach. And we can say we made lots of different knots and links in the past 13 years. Then we can say the development of strategies and the tactics that's complex knot and link are now realistic targets for us. However, the consequences of entanglement and topology on the properties are only just beginning to be investigated. That's how we work in our lab. In our group, we work in three different parts. The first part, of course, is the synthesis. We want development of some new, simple and robust and efficient Consenting methodology to build up those molecules. Particularly, we are interested in the topological chirality, which came from the topological information only rather than any other elucidating chirality. Uh, I need to emphasize that we also work on the road taxing, which is topological non trivial. And the difference between uh, the, the connection between the road taxing and other. North and the links are though all contain the mechanical bond. Once we made those molecules, we actually introduced the single molecule techniques into 
is that uh, to study the dynamic or the mechanic properties of those molecules at single molecule level, apart from understanding the fundamental property structure relationship, we also want to use this beautiful molecule for function and some function that can only be uh, made from those uh, entangled molecules. For example, we uh, we define the the not define we establish the the molecular weaving approach using topological building blocks to make the weaving fabrics just like the, the weaving fabrics we use in our daily life. We also want to transfer the topological information from molecular level to a larger scale such as liquid crystal or polymers. So today I will only focus on because the uh, in the first two talks, uh, Julia and uh, Grace have shown you the a lot of the synthesis and the function of the material and some of the phys fundamental physical property of those molecules. So today I will give you a very brief talk on a single molecule study on the mechanical interlock molecule and not on the limb. Before we want to do that, we must know what kind of motion exists in those molecules. For example, for your taxing, this contains a strand and a microcycle. The microcycle can travel along the strand. It generates a large amplitude motion. Called, we call it a translational motion. And for the catenate, it's actually the two rings or multiple rings interlocked together. And if we only consider two rings, and with one ring steady, the another ring will go the rotary motion within the catenating architecture. And for the nose, it's quite different because it contains a backbone reputation. You can say when you stretch the two ends of the nose, it will get tight, and when you release the force, it will get loose. So if you want to study those kind of motion at a molecular level, what you realize is the size of those Artificial molecular machines and topologies are around 10 nanometers. And the change of the building block around 1 nanometer, that means you must have a very good spatial and a structural resolution. And the most of motion was within those architecture around the, uh, in a millisecond time scale. So your time window should be in a millisecond scale. And before that, we we do those kind of, we study those kind of motion by ensemble experiments such as NMR and Uli. That actually they give you an average result for example, if you make ten thousand molecules at one time, you will get then you will get the information from most of the how most of the molecules behave. If you have only one molecule behave differently. This information cannot be identified because it's just like a noise in a, in a, uh, in another lot of information. However, if you use single molecule experiments, you could direct observation of the behavior of the molecules. That means you actually measure one molecule for 10,000 times, then you will collect all the possible signals. However, now you need to consider how to translate those kind of molecular motion to a signal that can be detected directly. Our group is not the first group who, who joined this uh, area. The Fraser students in, two, uh, in 2006, they first introduced EFM within to the Mechanics interlock structures in this paper show that you, you can use EFM to distract the or distract the ring from the rotaxing architecture. And later on, Lee and Anne Sophie actually make a very cool paper on nature nanotechnology in 2011. They introduce EFM and show that actually the shuttling process in the rotaxing. And then later on, my friends Emilio Paris and April in Spain introduced the optical twins into this system. And uh, by using optical twins, they're able to get the whole dynamic dynamics of this low taxing shuttling processes. 
However, in those seconds, you still have problems. The first thing is both AFM and optic sensors are based on the fishing experiment. That means you might collect some one trace one day, maybe one trace in seven days. You have a, you need to collect a lot of data in a long time to make sure that the data you analyze is a trustable thing. The second thing is in the data collected by optic trainer, they can compare compared with the data collected by EFM because they have the different operational environment. The third thing is about the resolution. For example, in, two, in 2021, Lee and Sophie, and they, re, they report that by using the same real texting, they're able to find a very weak intermediate in a non-polar solvent. However, in the aqueous space, op optic things that cannot observe this very weak intermediate. That means the resolution of the technique is really important for you observe some very weak intermediate. Now we look at what else single technique, single molecular technique we can use and we realize that magnetic strings actually is a very, very good candidate. First of all, it can be used for high throughput analysis. That means you can measure lots of the data in one time and accelerate your research a lot. And another thing is by using magnetic strings that you can do rotary operation, which is good for the catenine like uh, architectures. Then we say, could, be, uh, could we do this? Could we introduce the magnetic strings into the molecular interlock, the mechanical interlock the molecules? Then we design this molecule. We deliberately use the same real taxing, but change, introduce more oxygen in a in a thread, in the center of the thread, because we want we want to observe the weak intermediates. Meanwhile, we want to compare the data we collect with other techniques. And then we introduce the drop diving diving to connect the to connect to the magnetic uh, belt, uh, base, and then leave a functional group the alkane to connect with the surface. For the first design, we tried to use a PEG modified surface with azide, and we tried the click chemistry. Although the chem click chemistry won the Nobel Prize just a few years ago, I was still finding problem in this step. And we we can major, we can get the, the good result by by using the molecular changer, but the efficiency is not good enough. And then we say, okay, we can do a DNA. We have overhanding a handle and then with oligo azide. So we actually click the molecule to the DNA handle. Then we get much higher efficiency. By using this way, we're able to collect more than 100 trees in one time. You can see those all small red dots are the molecules we connected. We actually operate them in one time and collect the data at the same time. By having those large amounts of data, we're able to measure the distance between the two stations. And we're also able to measure the forces by breaking the, the binding between the microcycle and, uh, uh, and the two stations. And then when we have this data, we compare it, uh, it with the data collected by optic things that we can say those are very compatible data. Meanwhile, by having the uh, magnetic strings, uh, we are able to study the distributions between the two stations on the different forces. And also we are able to obtain the, uh, the force that uh, the force that can make the ring stay half and half between the two in two different stations. The most important thing, the operation of this molecule in a polar solvent actually in water, we are still able to see the very weak intermediate. If you remember the structure, the weak intermediate is actually stable by hydrogen bond. It's really, really weak in the polar solvent. By having the magnetic twins, we are still able to observe, it's very clear the weak intermediate that cannot be observed by either EFM or the optical twins.
when we finish this work, we then actually when we're doing this work, we want to do the environment dependency, the dynamic that depend on the environment change. Then if uh, if people know the the single molecular force spectroscopy, they know that it's really hard to study the temperature dependent behavior because once you hit the cell, it's going to give you a lot of noise or you will disconnect the molecule from the uh, from the probe. Then we see another possible single molecular te technique called single molecular junction. In this system, they actually use the electronic signals. Then you connect your molecule on the graphing-based uh, molecular electrodes. And then when you have the conformational change, or you have the binding on, on binding behavior, then you will have a different electronic signal. Using this technique, it can, uh, you can measure the dynamic in a much milder condition. The good thing is, this, this technique also has a very decent resolution, giving you structural resolution in one nanometer, and the time resolution around 17 micro, uh, microseconds, sorry. And those techniques give another a big advantage is that it has a high stability, and it's very easy to fabricate those electrodes. Of course, it also has a drawback because the distance between the two electrodes is around two to three nanometer. That means when you design your molecule, you must be uh, make sure that your molecule will be connected between the two gaps. And by using these techniques. The early time that Xue Feng in Peking University collaborated with Fries has reported the, uh, the observation of the host gas interaction and also the hydrogen bonding. And the recently, they showed that by using this technique, they're able to uh, study the, the dynamics of the procedural detection system. And we say it's, it should be able to do in a low taxing, uh, low taxing system. And then the, and this is our design. So you can see we have the bridge, which contains a five aromatic ring with two LK, with a round distance around two to three nanometers. And it's very rigid, give you a very good connectivity between the molecule and the electrode. And then in the strand, we introduce a primary binding site, which is a DBA for Chrome ether, and a methylated the trizalo group as an empty station, which is a second binding station. By connecting them together, we use the two trizalo rings because it's the most easy, easiest chemistry. And we think able to uh, allow us to real-time observation the, the shuttling process by using the single molecule junction. And then this is the uh, instrument we use, we actually put this uh, uh, molecules in a, uh, with a thermal couple and in a micro channel. That means it will allow us to more, uh, observe the uh, temperature dependent behavior as, as well as the solvent dependent behavior. And we want to, uh, possibly, we want to observe the weak intermediate. Uh, binding between the microcycle and the trizello range, which cannot be observed by any other ensemble experiment. So first of all, we collect the data and did the data analysis for the thermodynamic and the connected parameters. We can, from those data, we can say that the ring actually stay in the PB, which is the first primary binding site for the most of the time. When you increase the temperature from 288K to 328K, and it's the, trans, uh, the translational motion of the mass cycle became faster, and it will stay in the uh, empty station for longer than before. And by using the early equation, we're able to get the uh, thermodynamic uh, data of this low taxing. And then we did the uh, we also measure the the uh, 
that G value in different two solvents in S9 trans DMSO because they have different polarity. And it should change the uh, delta G value of the rotex in and we compared the data with the theoretical data and it shows a very good consistency. And most interesting thing is when we zoom in those the electronic signal of some area, we are able to see a very small and short platform between the MT and the DB station. That means we're able to observe the transition transition stage. So the whole shuttling process can be pictured in three steps. First of all, the rain stay in the DB station here, and then they trans they move to the trizalo station, the purple and the blue ones, and then they move to the the MTA station, the the yellow one, and then they move back to one of the two wake intermediate states and then back to the the debate station as the whole shuttling processes. You can say it very clearly based on the electronic signals. That's what we did on the detecting architecture. And last piece I'm gonna introduce you how we use the mechan uh, AFM to study the mechanical property. So we people are very interested in the mechanical property of the nodes because they exist in the polymer chains. They form simultaneously in the polymer with sufficient length and flexibility. In 1999, Michael Klein published the, uh, the paper on nature, showing that when you stretch a node, uh, all carbon node, always breaks the bound that's in, at the angle of the knot and is close to the crossing point. In the same issue of nature, Haroda used optical twins that actually tie a polymer knot and stretch it and shows totally different mechanical behavior comparing with the linear chain. And it's also proved that in the polymer knots, when you stretch it, also break. If you give enough time to reorganize the structure, get this, the thermodynamic uh, state, it also breaks the entrance of the knots during the, uh, 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 close to the crossing point. So that shows that the knots actually behave totally different with the linear strand because of the entangled architectures. And the rest of the, the work in this area mainly focused on the simulation. It's because it's a lack of the suitable system that can be used to give the molecular level information, experimental information. And then, uh, in the early uh, 2016, they report the formation of the uh, lysinide overhand knots. And then we, then we realized maybe we can introduce the two long chain and then connect it to EFM that would possibly allow us to measure the mechanical property of the knotted structures. And this is the molecular design. You can say the knot is not fully compact, it's contained a loop around one nanometer. And then we connect the molecule in, uh, to the EFM and then we strengthen the end and we got the fourth profile. We can see a clear the platform uh, with the force around 150 piconewton. And the delta X is around one nanometer. It's matched very well with our, uh, with the length of the loop. That means when we strengthen the knot, the knot get tighter, but not breaking. And then we, when we release the force, the knot that goes back to the original state very quickly in a very short time scale. That means when we have this metal in the central, because of coordination, because of coordination bond, it gives enough energy to release the force and generate the original loose knot. We also did some simulation to understand what really happened when you have force on the two ends of the knot. From here, you can say, first of all, the triple pi pi interaction breaks when you have the force. And then when you're pulling, when you're further pulling the knot, one of the, one of the loops, the pack loop actually goes into the knotted region. 
and will keep pulling. Another loop will go into the node to region as well. However, from you can say in the center in the center of the node to region, the lutetium may always stay there. And then you can compare with the, the protein nodes. The synthetic node actually shows more compact and higher stability. And if you compare this noted ligand with the linear strand, it shows that the noted can adapt around 13 kick up more mechanical strands comparing with the linear strands. And that will be important when you introduce those noted molecules into the polymer. That means it will behave, uh, it will give you a better performance on the mechanical property. Let me give you a very quick and uh, brief summary. So in this talk, I will show you that we introduced the magnetic twins that allow us to analyze the dynamic of the relaxing in the high throughput modes. And the data are compatible with the EFM and the uh, optical twins that data obtained before. And now we use a single molecular junction observe the environment-dependent dynamics of the two-row taxing. In the last part, we think that using EFM on the synthetic nodes enable to major the mechanical property of the node the molecule that's giving you the, the uh, overview by having the nodes in the polymer. And then the last most important thing is that when you combine the single molecule techniques with the mechanical interlock molecule, that offers you unlimited potentials and not only give you a good guidance when you design the molecule, but also show the fundamental property or dynamics that cannot be observed directly by assembly experiment. Last but not least, I want to say thanks to all of the collaborators around the world, particularly the Xue Fengguo in Peking University and the Wei Li in IBP class. And also, I would like to thank to all of my group members who works really hard in the lab and also for the funding, also the funding for the financial support. And thanks for your listening. I'm really happy to take any of your questions in the QA session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for this talk where you guided us, uh, I really would say, uh, one molecule at a time. And um, this is the last uh, uh, talk for today. Uh, so I, I thank um, uh, Liang and Grace for their talks. And uh, we open the discussion. And I do this by introducing uh, Wenti Liu. Uh, there is a panelist today with us from the University of South uh, Florida, USA. So let me say something about uh, Wenti. So he did his um, uh, PhD at the University of uh, Notre Dame in the United States uh, under the supervision of uh, Bradley uh, Smith. And during his PhD, uh, he developed uh, bioconjugation uh, techniques and uh, host against the uh, binding affinities of, um, of guest systems uh, that were that had uh, binding constant up to 10 to the 11 molar minus one, which is an extremely high uh, value. So during the PhD, there is a consistent part of uh, supermolecular chemistry in um, uh, in water. And then he moved for his uh, postdoc um, at Northwestern uh, University with Professor uh, Stoddard, uh, where he studied uh, interlocked uh, molecular machines. And actually, I, I, if I, if he's present, I would kindly ask him to uh, turn his video on because I don't see uh, Wenki in this uh, Wenki in in this moment. Uh, actually, I do believe uh, my camera is on, and uh, and I think my audio is also on. Just make sure you can hear me here. Okay, perfect, perfect. Thank you very much. Now I can right. hear you. All right. Uh, uh, and, and I also see you. Yeah. So, all right. So, um, well, actually, just to conclude uh, your introduction, so now uh, your group um, as an assistant professor at the Department of Chemistry at the University of South Florida uh, covers uh, molecular recognition, uh, disease diagnostic uh, and therapy, 
as well as supramolecular uh, functional materials. And um, I mentioned in the very, uh, very beginning of uh, today's event, uh, during your path, uh, you have been co-author of four different patents. So I would uh, I kindly ask you uh, if you can tell us something more about uh, about you, about your research. Yeah, oh, great. Uh, first, thank you very much for the introduction and also the invitation uh, for this uh, fantastic uh, platform. I really enjoyed the three talks. Uh, I have to uh, get a lot of ideas now. Uh, yeah, so briefly introduce about myself, as Guidi already said, and I'm, I'm currently an assistant professor at the University of South Florida. So my group is relatively young. So we are at the beginning of our third year since I started my group in 2021. So my group's research mainly focus on supramolecular organic chemistry. So basically we used organic synthesize to design and synthesize the uh, molecular containers that shows a high selectivity and affinity for the target of interest. So we applied the supramolecular approaches to uh, tackle a, a different problem in different areas. For example, in the field of material science, you know, we are trying to uh, help with uh, lithium ion batteries, particularly for the recycling technology of lithium ions as a critical mineral. So we are currently working on, on synthetic molecular receptors that selectively unbind lithium. So the idea is with available of these high performance lithium receptors, we could develop potentially some technologies that can um, uh, make the lithium harvesting more easier uh, from natural resource like solids or geothermal brines. And we also can um, develop um, these uh, materials that can recycle this uh, lithium from waste batteries. And so this kind of lithium receptor for me might have some further applications in, in um, this uh, lithium selective membranes to fabric the batteries. So in, we also have another direction that is related to health. So we are working on this uh, synthetic receptor that particularly uh, show their functions in water. So we are interested in making these um, water-soluble uh, molecular receptors uh, that uh, select to bind these um, bioactive uh, molecules such as glucose. So the idea is by taking of these reversible non-covalent interactions, we could achieve this reversible or continuous sensing of these bioactive materials. Hopefully that can give some health, uh, helpful information uh, for the disease diagnosis and also uh, uh, management. Then we are also interested to integrate these uh, receptors that are um, uh, selective for biomolecules into a, a biomolecular switches. So we hope to achieve this kind of um, a function on switching of biomolecules such as peptide and proteins uh, with the uh, uh, presence of uh, uh, variations of these biomolecular concentrations. So that might be helpful um, for develop some potential therapies to treat some uh, disease. So these are the two general uh, research directions in my group. We're also interested to uh, study these fundamental principles of molecular recognition. So particularly, how do we um, use uh, this effectively use uh, like weak interactions such as hydrogen bonding in compatible media like water. So actually, I saw this presentation from Leon's slide. He observed this kind of uh, weak interaction even in water. So actually, that is one of these um, research topics we are quite interested in my group. We are trying to understand what kind of uh, uh, molecular and uh, de design principles we can use to make molecular receptor that combine this bioactive molecule in water using hydrogen bond. Yeah, so that's kind of a general description of my research group. And currently, I am looking for graduate student. So, if any of the audience are interested to get a PhD degree or have experience uh, as graduate student in the US and to study supramolecular organic chemistry, please contact me. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. And actually, so in in your uh, in, in what you were saying, actually you connected nicely uh, with the, um, the research of um, Liang Zhang. So then, uh, shall we try to continue this uh, chain, so this interlocked uh, structure? And uh, shall I ask uh, Liang to connect to another topic that uh, was touched today, so that we can highlight the links? Yeah, can I? Yeah, so um, when she mentioned um, um, weak interactions as uh, a connection to your uh, to the topics that yeah. you touched, so shall we continue this uh, this chain of connections 
and highlight some connection of your research with other topics that were uh, touched? Yeah, sure, sure. I, I think it's a very good point because uh, we know that those weak interactions are very dependent on the environment. So, for example, the hydrogen bond, which is the, the one of the most common weak interaction exists in a bio system. And those hydrogen bonding uh, can be really weak in a polar solvent. And they have a lot of different math uh, strategies. For example, introduce the multiple hydrogen bonding. They will work cooperatively. That gives you a higher binding affinity. However, in our case, why the reason why we can observe this very weak intermediate because, because the hydrogen bonding actually form in a, a restricted, restricted space, I would say. It's like the rotaxing, the ring actually they lack a cage. That means when it forms the hydrobonding, it tends to form with a strand because especially close to the microcycle. And then the, the microcycle actually can vortex the strand away from the, the water or the polar solvent to break the hydrogen bond. I think that would be something uh, important for designing the, the specific system that's contains a lot of weak interactions in, in a strong environment. That's my opinion. Maybe maybe I'm, I'm wrong. Maybe, Grace, can you comment on the importance of uh, weak interaction like in your chemistry? So you have this, you are designing how molecules can reach in the solid state. So uh, that's really critical, I imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the I guess the common theme here is that we are trying to control the intermolecular interaction in one way or another, photochemically, mechanically, thermodynamically. Uh, yeah, I think it's very important, uh, not only in the yeah solution state, also in solid state or condensed phase. Uh, it's even um, greater effect because there because of millions of collective intermolecular interaction that are affecting the overall uh, bulk property. Um, yeah, so I think that's, uh, yeah, it's a very unique skill that organic chemists have. Uh, so we can design the molecular structure with the subtle changes uh, with the functional groups that we can actually control uh, quite, uh, the bulk property quite uh, easily. Uh, and I think it's um, really fabulous to be able to use our chemist insight to be able to predict the, the materials property. And then as a commonality, I also see uh, among our research, um, I'd like to highlight that we're all studying the out of equilibrium state. And then uh, in particular uh, for my research and also Julia's research, we are uh, actively taking advantage of these energetics uh, involved in this non-equilibrium processes. And I'm really delighted to see that you're also pursuing um, this uh, energy storage uh, applications or cooling uh, thermal energy control also by designing molecules to uh, you can control the energy barriers that are very critical in controlling this uh, processes. So yeah, I'm very happy to see all of your work. Thank you very much. And actually, this is really something that um, I would say connects two teams because uh, so we use for this the mechanical bond because it's a bond of which where it's easier to control the kinetics. And so away from equilibrium, having control of kinetics is very, is very important and it's hard to do with other with other structures. So this is more or less how we have merged the, the themes. And actually, there is um, there is one aspect that maybe brings uh, a little bit closer uh, um, uh, the, the chemistry of uh, uh, Grace and Wenzi. Uh, which is the, the somehow the proximity with uh, a practical application, let's say, is a little bit closer to some fundamental studies that maybe myself and Liang have presented. And so I wanted to ask to both of you if uh, there are some uh, aspects, actually, which are the lessons that uh, you think maybe we can learn uh, by interacting with, uh, with the industrial world. You, you maybe... Either, either of you can start as you prefer. Well, I can start uh, first. So uh, as I said, I'm one of the directions in my group is focusing on this multi receptor for lithium. For this project, we do have to consider about the practicability. 
So um, for for most of these uh, organic receptors, the, the, the reported organic receptors for lysium ions, they are mainly based on crown ethers. So these macrocycles um, structures all the binary lysium well, but the issue is the uh, the difficulties in the synthesize of these microcyclic structures. It usually involves uh, high dilution conditions and or, or involve the use of template. And that make um, this kind of uh, availability of this kind of high performance receptors uh, very expensive. So if from the practical point of view, from the industry point of view, I would say they are probably not going to adopt these cryosers as their uh, materials to a separate lithium because the price is just too high. So when we design our project, we do consider this kind of limitation. So instead, we focus on the structures that are involve acyclic uh, um, um, uh, molecular skeletons, um, but that still has performance uh, to binary lithium. So that also create a new challenge is what are the molecular design principles then we can try to develop so to get this structure that are easy to make, but at the same time have high performance for lithium binding. The one thing that I think we uh, I learned from this uh, kind of um, industry point of view is that um, we do have to consider the practicability uh, if we are working on some project that uh, is uh, related to the uh, potentially um, practical applications. Yeah, I absolutely agree with uh, Wenchi's point of view. Um, so we do have some interactions with uh, industrial partners, or uh, we also have the entrepreneurship efforts uh, from the group. So we are always thinking about uh, what matters in the, the real world application. So uh, two of the things that I'd like to mention um, that we learned throughout this process is uh, the first, the scalability. So we... Uh, you know, we mostly study synthesize as novel materials in milligram scale or maximum a gram scale. And we can accurately measure the you know, parameters that are relevant for the application, such as energy storage time, energy storage density, and etc. But uh, the, the really valuable lesson um, that we learn by interacting with industrial um, uh, side uh, is that we have to think about what might happen if we, you know, scale it up to maybe kilogram scale or thickness of material in maybe tens of centimeter scale. Then uh, other, you know, important parameters, you know, like light penetration depth, how easy it is to charge this charge it in a bulk scale, how much, you know, heat can we generate? Is it effective enough to be transported to the, let's say, cold water that we are trying to heat? So, yeah, so these are the questions that we must uh, ask ourselves, but it's not very apparent if it's important at the small scale. So I think it's important to keep in mind that, um, you know, if this is like thousand times bigger than the sample scale, um, is it still going to work? So it's one of the things that we always try to ask ourselves these days uh, to be able to uh, make a real impact. So thanks for the insightful comments and um, I have to jump a little bit because we are uh, going towards the end of the, the time together uh, but there is a question that I really want to to ask uh, to Liang and Wenchi and then one for everybody so the one for uh, for maybe we can start with Liang and then move to, to Wenchi is um, uh, I, I was curious to ask how working with single molecules uh, has changed the view of the ensemble level. I think it, it could be interesting to comment on your side. Okay, cool. Now I will give you two examples. The first example is a recent publication of a science paper. They use the, the, STM, the mass spec with STM, they are able to observe the glycans bonded to proteins and lipids. Now the single molecule, molecule techniques have, have been well developed in many different ways. Now I show you that we can use these techniques to observe the single molecule motion. But meanwhile, that means you can also observe the motion of the proteins, DNA, and then a lot of biomolecules. That will give you the very clear molecular level mechanism of how those biomolecules function, operate in the, in the environment. The second thing is, the second example is actually uh, both you and Grace mentioned that you're working on the design of the molecular machine and useful function and both in equilibrium and the, um, away from equilibrium states. 
So when you walk on the, away from equilibrium states, you need to have an actual energy external stimuli. We normally use the chemical field. And when you have the chemical field, you want to use your field with 100% efficiency, for sure, because it cannot be reached in a microscopic way, a world, because you always consume the energy in different way. However, it is possible to 100% use the chemical energy in a medical level. Once you want to achieve this goal, you must be careful with the design of the molecule. For example, the one I showed you, if you want to shuttle a rain from one station to another station generates the force, then you must reduce the energy that's consumed on the strand, like the two weak intermediates are going to consume the energy. So the, the study on the single metal level will also give you a better, better guideline when guidelines when you design the molecule for function for a specific function. I think that's my answer. All right. So, so for my point of view, uh, so my group uh, look at this uh, molecular recognition properties of these receptors. So, so basically, these properties are on average of these assembled uh, bulk um, uh, assembled uh, molecules. Uh, so, but this ensemble property is determined by these uh, 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 molecular structures, even at the atomic resolution. So, we learned that uh, a slight change in the atomic um, locations within a molecular skeleton is going to have a significant impact on the selectivity and binding affinities. So we do pay um, close attention to um, these um, molecular structures uh, at atomic resolutions. We we just move one atom at a time to see how the impact on the overall performance of the these receptors to recognize the substrate. Um, so that that is very important for us to look at the uh, uh, molecular structures uh, at single molecule level. Thank you all. So this question, uh, due to time limitation, was closing the scientific part. And actually, I have one question that is a little bit extra scientific because we are all young PIs who relatively recently have started uh, our own groups. And so I wanted to ask you to share um, one positive aspect of starting a Z research group to end on a positive uh, note. So maybe Grace, you can start with just going the same round as, as before, if that's okay for you. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, for those of you who are you know, debating between maybe academia and industry, uh, I mean, both are great, but I'd like to uh, say, you know, being able to lead a team of students and postdocs is really a wonderful thing because you can really realize your big dreams and uh, answering big questions that you always had in your mind by putting together these talented people who are very enthusiastic and want to be on board with you. So I am really enjoying seeing the synergy between uh, various uh, students and postdocs of mine, and they bring in different skill sets, uh, different cultural backgrounds, and different you know, mindset scholarship. So I think it's a beautiful thing to observe and how they can work together to the, achieve the goal that I want to achieve. So yeah, that's uh, one of my joys. Um, yeah. Liang, feel free to... Okay, so uh, uh, I think I would like to share that the, the scientific career is a really, really long journey. You can have an initial destination, but you should not pay all of your attention on that destination. The only thing you should do is just keep walking and pay attention to all the scenery along the road, and you will find your real destination in some day in the future. I think that's what I want to share. All right, if it's my turn, I would say um, my favorite part of being uh, independent you know, uh, now PI is uh, first obviously this kind of academic um, freedom. So now I have um, the freedom to uh, pursue uh, my own research interests rather than restricted my um, visions within a, a research group uh, that is uh, tied to a, a PI, other PIs. So that gave me the opportunities, you know, to think about the big pictures, what are the, the impact of my research in long term, like in the next 10 years, 20 years, 
So what kind of research project I can apply that has this kind of long-term uh, impact. I also enjoy actually um, this kind of recognition as an independent uh, uh, PI. So every time, you know, so after we submit it, or, or, or after we, or I see um, our public community is, uh, is accepted as a, 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 at least as a corresponding authors, I now receive invitations to review uh, the ground papers. That is kind of a recognition um, for myself instead of my PI. So that gave me a sense of achievement that actually uh, kept me motivated about moving forward. Thank you very much. With this, we conclude uh, our um, our time together. And I just remember that um, the speakers will receive uh, a certificate for this uh, talk. And um, um, by highlighting the next uh, youth talk, number 38, which will be uh, next, uh, next week, and will be cover the topic of metal nanomaterials. I really want to thank uh, all the speakers and the panelists for uh, contributing and participating actively to the discussion, and uh, Aixia Zhang and all the ICANX uh, team for the organization. So thank you all uh, very much. Um, looking forward uh, to meet you also in person. Thank you. Bye-bye,是奇蹟 
中医生日快乐。该吹蜡烛了，来，我帮你。啊！祝你。